Okay, thank you. So yeah, the title of my talk is Writing Networking Clients in Go, and it's about the design and implementation of the NATS Go client. And then, uh, yeah, my name is Valdemar Quevedo, and you can find me on Twitter and Wally QS. I'm a software developer at Appsera, and I do development of the Appsera platform, and also, I'm also the maintainer of some of the NATS clients. I have been using NATS-based systems for a while, originally by doing uh, development and operations with Cloud Foundry, and these days with the Appsera platform that is also using NATS internally for communication among compon components. I use Go as my, for my daily programming. I really like the performance from the, from that we get out of using Go. So in this talk, first, I want to give a quick intro into what NAT is, NAT is the NATS project, and its protocol. Then we'll move on to making a deep dive into how the NATS Go client is implemented and working under the hood. We'll cover things such as how the NATS Go client is doing back pressure of I.O. and quality of writes, then how the, the fast protocol parsing engine from, from the client, some of the graceful reconnection uh, features from the client to be able to do uh, reconnect on failover events from a server when there is a disconnection, and also cover where we have used channels and where we have shied away from using channels for doing communication, and how we can use channels and along with closures and callbacks for doing uh, dispatching events and hooking up pluggable custom logic. So yeah, moving on with starting with the agenda and sharing about the NATS project. The NATS project it's a high performance messaging system. It is open source under the MIT license. It was created by Derek Collison in 2009. It was originally in Ruby. It was then rewritten in Go in 2012, and the project benefited a lot from this change. It is you can find it under the NATS IO organization. There is a website NATS.io. And the development is sponsored by Appsera. It has been used for in production for a while by dozens of users for doing for building microservices control planes. That was one of the main use cases for Cloud Foundry, again for internal communication. You can use it for service discovery or doing low latency request response, RPC, or just plain fire and forget pop solving. And some of these problems can be solved in multiple ways, but what makes NATS interesting is that it has a very simple and lightweight design. It's a TCP IP based system under an always established connection to the server, and over this established connection, you use, you use a very uh, plain text protocol that has very few number of commands. It has a very simple, uh, easy to use API, it's a small binary, just seven megabytes, thanks to a Go binary, it's like getting smaller. It's very few configuration, and again, it's just fire and forget. It doesn't have any built-in persistence of messages. So in terms of delivery guarantees, it is a must-once delivery. Now, this may sound like a limitation, but if we go back to the basics, into the end-to-end -end arguments and system designs under the section on delivery guarantees, we can read that a lower-level subsystem may be actually wasting its effort by providing a function that must, by nature, be implemented at the application level anyway. For we can easily do an acknowledgement of the delivery of the message when, um, for each one of the messages that we send. But in practice, this can it is helpful for some of uh, some some form of uh, congestion control. But knowing that the message was delivered to the target host is actually not very important. Because what we want to know is whether the target acted on the, on the message or not. So borrowing uh, the meme from the alien, if you can do something on the application layer, just don't bother doing it on a lower layer. That will keep the design simpler. So uh, there's, here are some links in the end-to-end -end argument. There's a really good talk from Justin Cherie uh, last year from the Papers We Love conference that I highly recommend. It's a must-watch. So the NATS project, it covers the at least once delivery by in just uh, implementing another project on top of NATS. It's also open source under the uh, MIT license. It's named NATS Streaming. So it's a layer on top of NATS 
and it enhances it with messages read delivery features and persistence of messages. Again, you can find it under the NATS IO organization, it's the NATS streaming server, and it's getting uh, fairly popular, increasingly popular these days. So, continuing with the agenda, and the next thing I want to cover is the NATS protocol, to show how simple it is. The NATS protocol has very few number of commands. Uh, from the client to the server, we can publish messages, subscribe, unsubscribe, or we can connect. From the server, we can receive uh, info strings uh, telling us some metadata about how to handle the connection. We can receive messages or error reporting some, uh, it can report some errors to us. We can send okay when, uh, to tell us that it has processed the command. And there's a mutually ping pong interval happening to keep the connection alive. So going real quick over how the protocol works, we establish a TCP connection to the server. The first thing we get is the info string uh, with information such as the maximum payload size, the identity from the server, whether we have to upgrade into using TLS. And we also can customize the connection by using the connect um, protocol line uh, by using a JSON payload. So here, for example, we're saying that this client is going to be labeled as with the foo, uh, with the label foo. That way, in the monitoring, through the monitoring port from that, you can see what is the connection, what is the name of the connection, and identify it uh, quickly. You can send ping to the server, to which we will get a pong back. Likewise, the NAT server is going to be periodically be sending you ping, and, um, uh, ping, ping in the client, and the client has to reply with a pong. It, if it doesn't follow this after some time, then it's going to terminate the connection. A client to register interest into a subject that can send a sub protocol line. So here you are registering interest into the, sub and the full subject using the arbitrary identifier one. And you have another client subscribing on bar, also using identifier one. And we can publish messages using pod. So here, how it reads is that we are publishing on the bar subject two bytes and after the uh, control line, there's going to be, uh, we're going to send, signal the server how many bytes it should be reading. So here's only two bytes, uh, saying hi. So that way, this, this other client is going to be receiving the message under the message um, protocol, protocol, then which is the subject, and on what is the identifier that it used when subscribing, and how many bytes it should read on this next line. You can also limit the interest into a subject by using on sub. So here you have subscribing of bar with uh, identifier one, then only want to, you only want to receive a single, a single response. So that way if someone publishes many payloads, then only one will be received to this client. And if you don't follow the protocol at any point, at any point of time, then the then server is going to disconnect you after sending you the error, right? So this is a quick example of using of a telnet session. So it's a, one of the benefits from the plaintext protocol is that it's very easy to debug and it's very easy to interact with uh, manually if you're doing. Um, there is a, has a functionality for doing wildcards. So you can tap into the protocol and see all the messages that have that are being sent. So here, here we are publishing a message and unsubscribing after one, then not following the protocol, we get disconnected. Now, starting to go into the internals from the client, the first thing I want to cover is the internal I.O. engine. We'll I'll talk about how is the optimized flushing works and the fast protocol parsing engine that's working under the hood. So the NATS client, it's built around a couple of goroutines which are cooperating to doing the read and write from the socket and dispatching the messages and publishes uh, asynchronously. We'll call them the reader loop and the flusher loop. And when you are in a connected state into the, uh, to the server, we ensure that it's on, at any point in time there's only going to be a couple of goroutines uh, working. So we use a wait group uh, as soon as we connect and wait for them to, to stop running whenever we get a disconnection. And the overall picture of how this works, uh, it's sort of like this. You have a the flusher loop that is, just in, that is using an underlying buffer yog writer and is going to be sending the commands to the server. 
And from the other side, we have the reader loop that is going to be ingesting those, gathering those bytes and fit in, fitting them into the parsing loop. And it is very important that we do this in a performant way as from the server, if we don't read within two seconds the, the bytes that it's trying to send to us, then it's going to disconnect us because of being a slow consumer. Internally, how the, the, the flushing mechanism is, works is by using a buffer channel. So the buffer channel is being used to uh, do coalescing of the writes when we want to make a, a publish. So it, it is a go routine that is going to be waiting to be signaled to execute the flush only when there is some, some pending data. So whenever we publish here, let's say we are publishing onto uh, some subject, and we when we publish, we make uh, a write into the underlying buffer writer, and then if there is no pending flush here, we are going to be signaling with the empty struct that we want to um, schedule a flush into the server. So using the buffer channel helps into adding some back pressure to the client so that we don't just spend all the time doing uh, writing into the socket. And because if it is a buffer channel, then eventually uh, it will get to the point that uh, we can still pop right into the into the into the buffer log writer, and uh, but everything and yeah, the flusher will be responsible of eventually flushing everything. For the reader side of things, it's uh, we use a, it is implemented a zero allocation parser, so it is using a stack-based buffer. The, to make it performant. The, so this go routine is going to be continually trying to gather bytes from the server, and it's going to be feeding all the bytes that it has received from the, from the server and into the parser. Then the parser is, uh, although the, uh, the NAT server protocol is uh, it's fairly simple, the Go client implementation, it's, uh, it's fairly sophisticated, so it goes to but byte per byte, and it changes the, st uh, the state for the parser. So it tries to optimize so that um, it's uh, done in a very performant way. It has uh, handling of the split buffers scenarios in case well, one of the protocol lines, it has not read the full control line, then it's going to be uh, allocating, and it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be buffering for that the, in the next read, we receive the, the whole payload. Yeah, so this is the, all the states that the protocol has. For, Go, the, for the Go, if this is what we have found, that is the most performant. For when you're doing, implementing the protocol in other, in other languages, you've seen, uh, for example, regular expression has turned out to be faster, but this is really what uh, make the, the Go client uh, have gain more performance. So all of this internal engine is working uh, asynchronously. So whenever we publish and subscribe, send a publish and subscribe in the client, we never block. Instead, we rely on this internal engine to eventually flush everything that we have uh, put into the pending buffer and send it to the server. So here we have a simple snippet of the API. We have a couple of connections that uh, are connected to the server. This is the, the public demo endpoint, so in case you want to try. The first connection is going to subscribe on the foo subject, and then the other connection is going to be publishing um, bytes onto the foo, into the foo subject. Uh, and if we just run this code, code snippet, there's really no guarantee that we are going to, the first, of, first connection is going to be receiving those bytes. The reason is because, yeah, the, the, that might be just being still in, uh, the flush might, flushing might not be happening yet. And this is a very uh, frequent, frequently asked question when for new users into the project, because if something happens, if everything is happening asynchronously, then how can I ensure that I can uh, that everything that I have sent has been processed by the server? So I, how can I continue to be um, programmed synchronously? The way you can ensure ordering into your uh, here is by using the leveraging the protocol and using a ping and pong. So this, the NAT server gives us the guarantee that anything that we publish into the, anything that we write and send to the server is going to be processed in the same order. So we do have the guaranteed ordering there. 
So this means that we can continue to use the, the ping pong interval so that whenever we are done sending the, a number of protocol payloads, we schedule a ping and then wait for the pong reply to be sent by the server. So in this example, we have the, the flusher that is going to, let's say we have a sub, then accommodate the, send the, uh, schedule the ping to be sent. We're going to wait for the pong to be received from the client, and that means that anything else that has been published will be received. This technique, we call it the, the NATS flush, and what it does under the hood is fix, it makes a buffer, it forces a flush on the buffer IO rider after writing the ping, and it does the server round trip for us. So here we have the NATS connect, one, the, a couple of connections, and the same example, we will make a subscribe on the full subject. We make the flush in the first connection so that we ensure that the, that the subscription has been uh, processed by the server. And then in the other connection, if we publish, then we guarantee to be receiving the, those bytes. Internally, how this works is we, again, use an, uh, we use an array of unbuffered channels per each one of the pending replies. So that's how they become represented. Then for each one of the pending flushes, we're going to be appending uh, a channel that into the array of punks, appending punks. And in the flush API, that's flush API, what we do is uh, that we have a timer that is going to uh, fire in case we don't receive the pong within, uh, 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 within the deadline. And then it's responsibility of the parser to gather bytes from the pong and get the receive and basically uh, pop one of the pending pongs and make a signal to the client flush that we have received the pong so we can sec uh, continue sequentially and it's going to be everything working asynchronously. Mm -hmm. uh, next thing is from the I want to cover is the, the connecting and graceful reconnection capabilities. So for customizing the connection for, for NATs, we use the, I think, very popular pattern, the function and option patterns. And we have, a, a, yeah, this, at the bottom, there's the, the blog post from Dave Cheney. And uh, so we, uh, we, this is very useful to uh, keep the, um, the API simple and then just continue to extend the features on the client. So yeah, it takes an, a, a variadic number of, of options. So you can use it to, for example, uh, set the, the, cred the credentials for the rest on, that, you, that are going to be sent by the client on connect. So yeah, we're passing the user info here in the, in the example on to, to connect, and we can set the, uh, the user and the credentials for this user. We can also customize TLS and set in the client certificates or the root uh, CAs. And at any point of time, the client is going to be in one of these states. So we, the philosophy of NATS is that it is meant to give you a dial tone to communicate with anyone in, into the, in the system. So we always want to be, be in the connected state. Again, there is a single established connection to the server. Uh, but in case, there is a, in case there is a failover, we need to gracefully handle the disconnection, reconnection, and then flushing from the internal buffers. And uh, so yeah, there's uh, some machinery for handling that. And uh, that is, makes, makes the user from the library continue to doing uh, transparent publishes and subscribes. And then uh, use that the client basically will do it, do the flushes, eventually it will flush for you. So uh, we start from the connecting state, which is where we get the initial info and we can start the TLS at that moment. We can then connect, and in case we need to authenticate, and we once again make a ping here, and that way we guarantee that the, the connect that we have sent earlier is going to be processed earlier before any other commands that we are going to be sending. While we are in the connected state, the there, in case we're using the cluster topology from the server in, and there are new servers joining, then the client will be able to reconfigure itself to know where, where are the endpoints from new servers and they be aware of the whole cluster topology. 
So in case the, the one that is connected against two right now, uh, there, is a, there is a failure, then it's going to pick another server if within the pool, get into the disconnected state, and try to eventually reconnect to one, one of them. We can, and at any point of time, we can explicitly call close into the connection, and that will make us reach the closed state. But if also during the reconnection logic, we are not able to reconnect to one of them, then, yeah, it also will uh, end up in the closed state, which is basically where you cannot interact further with the server. You can, by default, it is uh, enabled, the reconnection logic, but again, by using the variadic connection, the variadic options on connect, you can customize, for example, how long to back off in between the, those reconnects, what is the maximum amount of times that, that you want to uh, be reconnecting against a server. If you set this to be minus one, then that means that you're going to be reconnected infinitely. So, uh, one very cool thing from the client is that when you are in the reconnecting state, the underlying Bofayog writer that the flusher is using is going to be swapped instead for a, a in-memory-based buffer from Go. And, and it's very cool that all of this is far apart from the language, right? So we don't need extra dependencies since Go. It's all, all part of the standard library. So while, when you're in, during the reconnection state from the server, and you can continue to do publishes and subscriptions as if nothing had happened, as you will not get a synchronous error back at that moment when you're making those publishes. And instead, everything will be put into the memory-based buffer, and when you reconnect to one of the servers, it is going to replay the state of any subscription that you, have may, may, you may have had at that point of time, and then force the flush. So here is when you, here's how we're doing the swap of the there is a BW, which is the buffer writer that the client has. Then it's going to, here we're allocating the, the bytes buffer, with, and we allocate by default like eight memory, eight, eight megabytes of memory, and we do the reconnection under another Go routine. And yeah, well, uh, as I was mentioning, once you do the reconnect, uh, it is very important that you replay any state of the subscriptions that you may have had before the disconnection. So the way the reconnection is triggered is by doing the connect once again, a ping, waiting for a pong back to proceed, then replay all of the subscriptions that you may have done, then do the flush of anything that have may, may have been um, put inside of the pending buffer, from in, in memory based pending buffer, and then do the flush. And that's how we move into the connected state once again, if that works. There in the, uh, using, uh, again, the, functional, the friendly functional options, you can set the disconnection event handlers. So these are very useful for doing debugging of the transitions from one state to another. So in case we disconnected, we can add custom logic here. Or if we are reconnected, we can check to which server we are connected now and if there is a, we want to, we, the connection was terminated, then uh, handle that some way, maybe doing another connection. And this one is also very important, the asynchronous error handler. The, this one has a different firm, which is, takes the, takes the current state from the, the connection, and also gives you the subscription, as this is, this callback will be triggered whenever there is a, slow, you have a subscription that is not processing messages very fast. So this will allow you to detect which one is that, that subscription that is, not, that is not keeping up. And this, is, uh, this might be useful to, to show like uh, uh, each one of these callbacks is going to be called after the event uh, occurred. So there is an, another one that, uh, for the discovered servers. So we can also add logic from the, whenever we discover the server and whenever, uh, when, whenever dis they are disconnected, then the disconnected callback is called. And when we are reconnected, then the reconnect callback. We can call the reconnected callback. Uh, so on in how this works internally is by using a buffer channel for uh, scheduling all of the, the, the callbacks as, as they have been occurring. 
So this way we can have an order of the, the, the callbacks that have been dispatched. And also there's another go routine besides the, the reader, the read loop uh, and flusher that is going to be responsible of uh, scheduling asynch the asynchronous callbacks. So here we have the asynch asynchronous dispatch go routine uh, under a for loop waiting for to be signaled to call the, any pending callback uh, using that uh, state that it was closed over when it was sent to the, to the buffer channel. And uh, moving on to the different types of subscriptions APIs that the client provides, there is a couple. There is a, has both synchronous and asynchronous types of subscriptions, and they're both using, they're using either callbacks or channels in, internally. And the API for them is asynchronous subscriptions. They take a callback, and it works um, uh, so that, yeah. So yeah, those are the asynchronous subscriptions, and then we also, the, we also have the synchronous subscription that give you this uh, iterator-like uh, next message, so that you can wait and block for the next message on, on the, or until the deadline expires. There you, you also have the uh, capability to just, just pass a buffer channel into, for the subscription so that you can really manage um, however you want. Each one of these has a variation for a queue subscription, and they are pretty much the same. The only difference is that when you make a queue subscription, they are going to create a distribution group. So all of, and all of, this, all of those that have been registering to this uh, queue subscription, only one of them is going to be receiving a message. So that allows you to do uh, load balancing. And it's going to be happening randomly. So first, the asynchronous subscription, yeah, it takes a, it takes a subject and a callback. And Something very important to note here is that each one of the messages, as they have been read from the socket, parsed and, um, pro and processed into the, by the parser, they're going to be dispatched sequentially into the subscription. This means that, uh, yeah, so the first message will not, the second message will not be processed until the processing from the first message has, uh, it, it's done, so there will be accumulating. This means that it is potential, you, can, you could have some potential head of line blocking issues if you may, that you may run into these processing delays. Let's say you have an arbitrary time slip of five seconds into this callback, then the rest of the messages are going to be delayed by five seconds. And eventually the, the, I think this, the subscriptions by default is going to only let you to increase up to 65,000. Uh, pending messages, and after that you're going to be uh, reaching the slow consumer state and then call the asynchronous error callback so that you can hook into any custom logic that you may want to handle. So it is up to the user to take any, um, implement how they want to do the back pressure here or how they want to handle. So you. One easy way to do this is, for example, do spin up a go routine per each one of the messages, but that's, that could be questionable, so you can use a, a semaphore to only have a number of in-flight go routines so that they can be processing the messages. And for the, it is up to the user to do this in a case-by-case -case basis. And this, so this is how the head of block, block um, uh, yeah, this is the, the first go routine has a head of line, head of line blocking issue. But it is also important to note that the other subscriptions are not going to be blocking each other. So even if this first subscription is not very healthy and is processing very slowly, the other subscriptions are going to uh, still be able to process because this is because each one of the subscriptions has a go routine for uh, processing the messages. So, and this is uh, very cool that uh, the implementation from the asynchronous uh, subscriptions is that they're not using channels, actually. We are using a, a linked list of all of the messages. And so this way, the, the number of the, the messages that have been uh, buffered is going to be increasing on demand. And the and, and conditional variable is going to be used to make the signal of whether when to process the message. So, that, yeah, that's way, that way the list can only grow as needed. And 
in case you have multiple subscriptions, if we were used to use channels, then we have to, we can't prevent doing the allocation of a very large buffer. We don't really know how many bytes to, how many messages to receive. So this is the, the subscribe for the asynchronous, asynchronous type of call, uh, uh, subscriptions. We uh, spin up the goroutine for, it, for this particular subscription on, and the allocate a new conditional variable. Then the wait for messages goroutine is going to be waiting for the, pro for the parser loop to send, making a signal for when it can continue doing the processing from the next message. And when, uh, this is, um, so yeah, when, once the parser gets the message protocol line the, and gathers, gathers all the bytes from the payload, then yeah, makes the signal here. And uh, yeah, makes, makes the signal and then do, uh, yeah, continue to modify the linked list so that they can process the next one on the next, uh, if there is another one. Then uh, besides asynchronous subscriptions, we have the synchronous and channel subscribers. They're actually pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, they're using uh, channels as well. The, the, synchron the subscribe sync, actually what it is doing is allocating a buffer of 8,000 messages. And the channel subscription just let you customize how with the buffer size, right? So we go back to the process message that gets, uh, function that gets processed by the, the, by the parser. So each time that the parser get, receives a protocol line of the message on the subject, then we call this function with the payload of the bytes. And here you can see they have, uh, we already covered the asynchronous uh, subscriptions case. And we make a select to uh, when sending the message to the, uh, to the channel. And if the channel is not ready to receive at this moment and is blocking, then we reach the slow consumer state and also call the asynchronous callback and we have to add custom logic there to handle. And it is very important here that at any point of time we never block the, the, the reader, reader loop, right? So that's why we need to uh, be able to detect whenever one of the consumers is very, very slow to uh, never block during the reading loop. Yeah, because there is another a ping pong interval as well that we need to follow. Then there is the request response uh, APIs. These are actually using the, everything that we have shown so far, and you can use it for one-to-one -one communication. It's, it's everything uh, pure public subscribe. And it is, uh, you can see the request for, uh, for an API here. It's, you can give it a, a subject, then the payload bytes, and a deadline, and then wait for a response. So this one blocks, unlike the publish and subscribe, the, the other ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, Protocol-wise, well, how it works is uh, the way the one-to-one -one communication works is by using ephemeral subscriptions. Here we have the requester uh, making an ephemeral subscription and showing the, expressing the limited interest into the subject, telling uh, you know, it wants a single reply, and we have the responder uh, subscribing to the subscription that we will be sending a request to. Then the requester is going to send the broadcast on the on that help subject, tagging along the inbox that we want to use for the request, and then giving the number of uh, payloads, the, the bytes to, that the server should read, in case the pay, here the payload is uh, uh, please. Once we publish this, then the, the, the responder is going to be receiving the message, getting the, it, it will notice that it's, uh, it, it was tagged with, a, with an inbox to, that we can use to reply back. Then it's going to talk directly to this other requester by using that inbox and publish the message, which is the response. Then the requester gets the message that, that it can help. For doing the unique inboxes generations, there is a library named uh, Nats uh, UID, and UID, which is a very performant. It can make uh, generate identifiers at like 16 million per second. So yeah, it's very performance. It's, um, it's uh, you can find it also on the on the, the Natsayo organization. And this is how the request response roughly uh, is implemented. Uh, it was um, simplified a lot here. We can make a we're making a new uh, 
a new inbox, then make a subscription on this inbox. Then there's the auto-subscribe auto API to limit the interest, broadcast using the publish request, which basically just let us make the publish on the subject and also on the reply, uh, give the reply, and then we block. Um, there is a context variation for the same uh, request API that is request with context. So now we have two APIs for doing uh, blocking of the request response. And actually, this is the classic way of doing the request response. As uh, in the latest version of the server, we have uh, there is a less chatty implementation of this. So instead of uh, sending the on sub, now each one of the requesters is going to have a wildcard request. A subscription that is going to be reusing for each one of the requests that are going to be sending. So here the subscriber is on the subscribing on the help subject. We can for each one of the requests that we want to make, there is no longer an on sub. We publish on the subject that we want to make the request, then tag along the wildcard subscription along with another uh, segment uh, the dots pay, dots, um, uh, inbox that we want to that the responder can use to reply back directly. Then the, mess the responder is going to be receiving the message along with the uh, longer variation of the inbox, and then it's going to be talking directly into the inbox. Then the original requester will be receiving the message. Uh, this, is, this is not really how it works right now in the, in the client, so there is a, uh, it was, a lot was deleted. But essentially, yeah, there's another subscription, and then we try to craft these inboxes so that we can uh, short circuit once we delete the first message and then uh, drop anything else that we have received. Received, And also, there's a request with context variation of this new API. And so you can uh, activate in any time, uh, at any time one of the which request response uh, methodology you want to use. So now we have four APIs for request response. Uh, so here is uh, for doing the initial subscription that is going to be handling all the requests. Use a, a sync once to ensure that it only really uh, have one subscription handling all the request responses, all the request responses. And so going uh, right click on the uh, performance from the client. Uh, so, yeah, um, the end result of, all of, the, of the current engine is that if you publish um, uh, 10 million, uh, right now you can publish around 10 million messages under a one uh, byte payload. So it's very performant. We may think, like, could this be better? So, we can, fortunately, Go has really good tools to try to uh, keep things better into your. Into your into your libraries. And let's try some escape analysis, for example. So doing a quick go around of the escape analysis, we can see that all of the, everything that we published ends up being in the heap, which can, could be surprising. So yeah, there's like everything in the policy escape. Mm -hmm. So the uh, reason all of these escapes and, uh, is going to do the heap is because, well, we're using a Bofayog writer after all and calling the Bofayog write, just taking the bytes. Uh, there is a long no, uh, known issue uh, from, from Go that each time that we call write, uh, it's some, for something, uh, for a very silly reason, and it's, uh, each one of the writes that we make is going to be escaping, so it's going to cause the allocation because of the interface. Uh, this issue was uh, close as unfortunate, but yeah, this is basically what's. Uh, uh, making the, the publishes escape in our case for the implementation of the NATS client right now. But really, Go doesn't get in our way. I mean, we could get uh, real ambitious and then uh, use concrete types about the interface and make the write directly. Uh, so it's, it's very flexible. But uh, it's already pretty fast. So is it worth the complexity to take it to these uh, extremes? In, uh, in other parts of the client, although we actually have not used some of the built-ins from, from Go, and we have opted for some simpler implementations uh, that uh, have good performance. And so just to wrap up, uh, we have covered some of the techniques from that 
uh, Go allows you, um, that you have taken by using build things from Go, such as for doing the back pressure of Ion, the parsing, uh, fast protocol parsing, where we have used channels where you have uh, not stopped using channels. And that, so to conclude, uh, NAT's project, it's uh, a process of simplicity, really fits well with the, what Go provides. And NATS has really benefited a lot from this. And again, uh, Go is a very flexible assistant programming language, so we can opt into what are the trade-offs that we want to take. And there is a good, very good tooling in Go to make database decisions of when to, uh, which, which is the trade-off, whether you should take the trade-off or, or not. So this is uh, all for my talk, and uh, thank you. <laughs>